Hello, um, my name is Adrian Gilbert and if you're new to this channel I'm actually an author of mostly of books about ancient mysteries and forgotten history and I've, I've written a number of bestsellers including the ma book Magi I wrote in 95 and, and the Orion mystery which I co-authored with Robert Boval uh, that went out in 1994 and was a big bestseller. So I'm very much into this field, but today I'm going to be talking to you about um, this book here, a very old book actually, it first published in 11, 1136, and you can see my copy is not quite that old, but it's falling apart. Oh, I lost a page. Um, and uh, well thumbed. And you may be wondering about this book, it's called the uh, the History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. And you may be wondering, why are you dealing with this book? Uh, well, I first came across it back in, oh, it must have been about 1970, 71, something like that. And I read it and I thought, good Lord, what's this all about? <laughs> it's a very, very strange book uh, if you don't know its context. Um, it talks about the ancient history of Britain from way back before the Romans, long before the Romans, and then going through the Roman period, then ending into the Dark Age period with King Arthur and all of that, and, and uh, up until about uh, 688, I think it is, with the death of the last of the indigenous British kings. And you might be thinking, well, yeah, that's all well and good, but it's surely... Um, that's not true, is it? <laughs> it's nonsense. And that's what I thought for a long time. I thought, well, this is an interesting book. It's a good, good yarn, but uh, you don't take that too seriously. But then I met Alan and Barham, and this series is dedicated to Alan Wilson and Barham Blackett, who passed away, both of them, um, last year in 2023 and uh, Alan opened my eyes to a lot of forgotten history of Wales and Britain and what the, the Welsh have preserved in Welsh a lot of it but fortunately a lot of it is also translated and he you could say he initiated me uh, into this whole area of uh, study I hadn't really been too much involved in before of our ancient British history and I came to realize that this book this little book of Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, is actually the key to much else besides and unfortunately when you read this book uh, you, you're told almost immediately that it's it's a fabrication it's complete nonsense that this guy he he may have cobbled together a few bits and pieces from I don't know, Gildas and Nennius and one or two other sources, and, and then he added a whole load of fantasy of his own to it, wrote an extraordinary book, which for some reason became very, very popular, and mainly because it contains the first proper account of the life of King Arthur, um, and it took off, and it's still in print, and they, they, they shake their heads and they say, oh, you know, these uh, these idiots, they don't know what they're, they're into and it's complete nonsense. Well, in the next programme, I'm going to show you why the content of this book is not nonsense at all and is very well uh, founded. But we're, I'm going to keep that for the next lecture. What I want to talk to you today is about the situation as it was in Britain around... Um, the time of Geoffrey of Monmouth, who uh, in Welsh is called Grufford Up Arthur. And he lived roughly, we're not quite sure of his birth date, but he was born in 1095, 1095, and died around 1155. So he'd have been 60 at the time of his death. And uh, he was a monk. And he had lived in Oxford for quite a lot of his life, I think. Um, but also he was born in Monmouth, which is uh, a, a, a town in the eastern part 
of Wales, uh, not that far from Chepstow. It's in the, uh, in the county of Gwent. Or, no, it's in the county of Monmouthshire. <laughs> in the county of Monmouthshire. Um, and uh, it's a small, sleepy town. Actually quite pretty, and it's lovely around there. Um, but in his day, it was probably, you know, a bit bigger than it, relatively speaking, that it is now. Um, most of most of us, if we heard of Monmouth at all, we think about um, the Duke of Monmouth, who led a, uh, well, not a rebellion, he tried to seize the throne um, after the uh, the death of his father, I think it was James, Charles II. Um, but he, the, the Monmouth Rebellion was put down. Anyway, that's, that's beside the point. Um, and Geoffrey of Monmouth, he was a monk, and he, li he obviously lived in Oxford for part of his time because he was friends with another man um, called Walter. Um, so he wrote this book, which he calls um, uh, Historia Regum Britanniae, or the History of the Kings of the Britons, and he tells us that uh, his friend, or maybe he was actually his superior, uh, a man called Walter, who was the Archdeacon of Oxford, uh, handed him a, a small book written in what he calls the British language, by which he means Welsh, <laughs> that the English were not called British at that time. They're not called, we were not, I'm English, and we were not called British until around about 1700. The British were the Welsh. The ancient British who had been in, in these islands before the Anglo-Saxons invasions and the, the coming of the Vikings and the Normans and all these other people. Uh, it was only later on in the 18th century that the English came to be called British and the Scots as well were called British. Uh, that was part of the unifying um, process that happened under the Hanoverians. They wanted to bring the kingdom more together, especially uniting Oxford with Eng uh, uniting Scotland with England, and integrating and giving a common a purpose, a common sense of nationhood, with the introduction of the Union Jack and and all of this. So the the idea of being British in the ancient times, and right up until then, meant Welsh. So when he says it's written in the British language, he means the Welsh language. And this book, uh, Walter apparently uh, got from Brittany, which is um, the province in northwest France, which was peopled in the fourth century by emigrants from Britain. So they, they spoke, or still speak, uh, Breton, which is a language very similar to Welsh. Um, Welsh people can understand Breton and Bretons can understand Welsh. Not exactly the same because there's been certain divergence, but <coughs> quite similar, like also Cornish. So he had this old book, so it says, and he wanted it translated into Latin. So Geoffrey took this upon himself and he set about translating the book into Latin. And he says he does this in his own homely style. And his own homely style, he's not going to use any flowery language of uh, typical of other authors. And I think by that he's, he's actually pointing a figure, finger at the Oxford academics, who are always trying to outdo each other with their highfalutin language. He's going to talk in a very homely sense. He's going to translate this book so that anyone can read it. And you, when you do read it, you find out it is actually a ripping yarn that he's telling you. And to give it some kind of um, modern context, I would say it's a bit like uh, if you are reading the script um, of the... Uh, the new Netflix series about the royal family. Uh, what's it called now? Um, the Crown. The Netflix series of The Crown. And the, the Crown does tell you the history of modern times, of the royal family. But it also puts in a lot of uh, fictional 
dialogue. You know, we we don't know what these people would be saying privately behind closed doors and closed curtains. We don't know, but we do know the public situation, what they did, and what they, when when things happened, the death of Diana, or all of that. You get all that, but the crown makes it more homely, makes it more of a, a drama documentary uh, that we can understand and feel for. You get some kind of feel. And that is what Jeffrey's done with this history. With, when you compare it with what I believe is the original text, you can see how he's done that. And it doesn't mean that he's invented the story. He hasn't. But all he's done is he's elaborated it and made it a more homely with, you know, giving people more attributes and describing them when you don't really know what they look like or whatever. But um, the events are still the same events, but it's made more digestible. And that's one reason why his book took off and it became the major bestseller of its day. We have to put that in context because when every book that's uh, going to be read has to be written out in longhand, long before the invention of printing, um, to have several hundred manuscripts surviving of this book means it was a huge bestseller. Um, they took the trouble to copy it and because it would sell, that's why. Um, books were very expensive in those days. And one of the major reasons why it sold was it's the first uh, uh, book to really talk about King Arthur. There's been a, a few, uh, I think in Nennius, it talks a bit about the 12 battles and the Battle of Camelot. But this is the first book that introduces us to King Arthur as a real character. And it contains all the stories, you know, the major stories, the sword in the stone, you know. Um, uh, the Round Table and, and Guinevere. Um, so it's, it's uh, the stirring romance, and that's one reason why this book uh, is still in print to this day, because it does give us that story the, in the original form. But it's a lot more to it than that. And Guinevere, of course, is also of interest to people from the women's perspective and you've got to understand that a lot of these books would be read by women the men would be out fighting <laughs> the knights in armor they were, they were always out fighting in the middle ages uh, or doing other stuff uh, the women would be left at home in the castle and they they had sewing tapestries maybe or whatever but they also like to read they were educated people as well a lot of these noble ladies and they would they loved these uh, half Arthurian romances and later on there were all these other tales invented in the French court uh, the, by uh, the troubadours. So the story of Guinevere and how she uh, was Arthur's wife and then uh, he was off gallivanting and, and then she had an affair uh, and in the, in the main story that I'm sure you've seen it's, it's Lancelot isn't it? She falls in love with Lancelot and he falls in love with her, and he, uh, you know, eventually they consummate their passion, and he's very ashamed of himself for betraying his king, you know, King Arthur. Uh, in the, in Geoffrey's story, um, her betrayal is actually with Mordred, who is King Arthur's nephew, and usurper, usurps the throne, while Arthur's away fighting in, in uh, France or Gaul, as they call it in those days. Um, so it's a rather different story, but you can understand why these ladies might, um, you know, have certain feelings for that, because their they're men are away. And in Norman times, people did play away from home a lot, especially the men, of course. They, they often had mistresses, but some of the women, too, uh, would also play around a bit. So you can understand... Um, the, there's a bit racy some of these stories and uh, that, that would go down well as well <laughs> as they do now anyway um, Geoffrey's tale of Arthur uh, was probably fairly restricted in his time I mean yes there were people would be reading it as I say it was a bestseller of sorts um, but what really took off was when the troubadours got hold of the story 
and particularly uh, a man named Chrétien de Troyes. I think I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> and Troyes is in the Champagne region of France. And he was a troubadour and he wrote um, the, the, the first uh, stories about the, the Knights of the Round Table and King Arthur and all of that. Uh, it, for popular things, I think they would sing some of these, uh, the, the chansons and that sort of thing. So those really took off among the French court and King Arthur became hugely popular throughout Europe, the whole story of Arthur. It's a, it, the Arthurian story itself is, is a tragedy, isn't it? Um, there he is, he, he has to drive out the Saxons, he has to fight to retain his kingdom which is breaking up, he has to bring the lords together, um, and he's a young man when he does this, uh, and then he builds the round table with all his knights, and they act like a police force, you know, going around, uh, you know, looking for damsels in distress, all that. Um, the whole uh, Arthurian romantic thing, uh, as a romance, really begins in France uh, at that time in the late 12th century. Um, but Geoffrey's story is much more than that. He, he is actually talking about a whole dynasty that goes back, you know, a couple of thousand years. So it's a much larger canvas that he's writing on um, than these, these later stories. But as I say, we'll come to that in the next episode when we go into the actual book itself. Now, the book, really, the, the whole stories, people were writing grail um, stories and stories of the knights, but it really came into his own with the publication um, of the Le Mort d'Arthur in 1485. And this was actually printed by Caxton. Caxton was the first printer to come to England with the printing press, uh, which was invented in Germany. Was it Guggenheim? I'm not sure. Um, invented the printing press. But Caxton came to, to England and he started printing Bibles, but he very soon caught on to the fact that there was much to be made if you would print uh, exciting Arthurian type tales, romances. And he, he published this book, this book. I got a, a two-volume edition of it here, of Le Mort d'Arthur. You can see it. Le Mort d'Arthur. And um, that's, been, that's still in print today. It's been going on and on and on. And that, that's the, the, uh, the ultimate bringing together of all the legends, all the mythology, all the stories, everything into these two big volumes of books. And um, there, there are other books as well. I've got one here, uh, another little, this is much smaller, two volume set called A High History of the Holy Grail, um, translated by Sebastian Evans. Uh, that's a lovely, these are lovely little books. They got lovely uh, pre-Raphaelite um, prints in them as well. You can find that sort of thing around if you look. Um, and of course, later on, people were looking at Arthur from the point of view of psychology. And I've got this book here. Uh, this is by Emma Jung, who is the wife of Carl Jung, C.G. Jung. And she writes a Grail legend, which she goes under the whole um, psychology <laughs> involved in the Grail legends and the archetypes and all of that kind of thing. So that's that approach as well. Is, you know, people have done. But the main story goes back, as I say, to Geoffrey of Monmouth, and we need to look at that. But before we do that, of course, the whole story of Arthur and uh, the Mort d'Arthur was turned into uh, a, a movies. It's been done a number of times, but I think the, the greatest movie of all of the Arthurian. Now, if you haven't seen it, I really recommend you go and see it. Is Excalibur? It was made in 1980, 81, I believe, and uh, you have all sorts of famous actors in it. So you've got uh, 
Nigel Terry as Arthur, Cherry Lungi, she's still around on TV, you see her, as Guinevere, Liam Neeson was Sir Gawain, Nicole Williamson was Merlin, he plays it, he has this strange silver hat on <laughs> throughout it, there's Merlin the Magician, um, he plays it excellently, he, he's passed on now unfortunately, and then of course Helen Mirren, you know, my favourite, um, she plays Morgan Le Fay, and doesn't she radiate the, that uh, mystical uh, attractiveness uh, the, of the uh, the, doubt, the one who brings about the downfall of, of Arthur's empire with her feminine charms and her mag magic, her witchiness. She does it wonderfully. And... If you haven't seen Excalibur, you really should. And you'll see all these actors that I mentioned when they were much younger than they are today. This is quite an eye-opener, just from that point of view. But, going on from that, um, we got to get back to Geoffrey of Monmouth himself. In 1136, when his book was first published, all of these books and films and all of that was far off in the future. They didn't even have the printing press for another 300 years plus. So, um, you know, there was none of this going on. He didn't have any thought about this. He didn't have any thought about chansons and, uh, and, uh, and Chrétien de Troyes. Chrétien didn't even write his books until much later. So he was just writing or translating this other book, uh, in his homely style, which we'll be discussing in due course in the next lecture, um, he was doing this, taking what was the old Welsh histories as preserved and had been taken to Brittany and brought back to Britain. And Walter, who was probably his boss, um, said, you know, here's his little book. It might have been something like this. He handed it to him and said... Here's a little book. I don't understand. It's written in Welsh. Can you please translate it into Latin? So Geoffrey said, oh, all right. <laughs> and he goes off and he translates the book. And he, he also incorporates into it um, another book, which is the, um, the Book of Merlin, Merlin the Magician. Uh, that, that's a quite separate little, you know, it, it's put in just in the right place within his overall book. But you can tell it's a different kind of language, it's different text, different kind of everything about it is different from the rest of the text. But he's inserted it there because he feels that this is the right place to put it. People would want to know about this Welsh history and they want to know about Vortigern and Arthur and all of that. Well, I'll put it in there as well. So he adds that as a little bonus. Um, he, he doesn't say, I believe in these prophecies of Merlin at all. He says, well, that's what it says. Um, take it or leave it. But he's put it in there for completeness. And that, I think, is also something that's really made this book um, so popular. Anyway, the tragedy is that the story of Arthur, blended, told and retold over and over again, has overshadowed the rest of Geoffrey's book. While it is wonderful that the legend of Arthur lives on right into the 21st century, there is far more to the history of the kings of Britain than the tragedy of Arthur. Yeah. And in this episode, excuse me reading this off the screen, but I want to get it correct. In this episode, I want to look at the political background in which Geoffrey was writing. It may seem strange to some, but he was not writing an historical treatise with the aim of gaining a PhD at Oxford. This is the trouble, you know, when people look at Geoffrey's book, it's usually academics and they tear it apart. You know, well, you didn't get that right, did he? Well, oh, that's wrong. Oh, that must have been stolen from over there. <laughs> um, they pull it apart. With their, because they're trying to score points, they're trying to write a thesis sometimes to get their PhD. And if they have to say something new, they can't say, well, this is a wonderful book. It's really it's great. I really enjoyed it. They've got to find something to discuss and pull apart. Otherwise, people are not going to take them seriously as scholars. I fortunately don't have that problem. 
<laughs> I'm not at Oxford and I have no interest in, in going to Oxford well, other than as a visitor. Um, I don't have to impress anyone. Actually, when I went to university, I studied chemistry. I'm actually a, a more of a scientist than a historian as such. And I think that's allowed me to have a more open attitude to a lot of these subjects that I deal in. Because I, I haven't got um, to look over my back. What are they thinking about what I'm saying? Will it stop me getting a professorship if I dare to, to, to print this? Because it disagrees with what they think. And if I disagree too much, they're going to block my path. I don't have to worry about that. I can just say what I think and what I have found by study. And that's what I think Jeffrey was like. Um, he took this book and he thought, well, the English and the Normans don't know anything about all this. I'm going to tell it to them. I'm going to sock it to them. This is the Welsh view and see what happens. So I think there was an element of that to it. So I will seek to prove the truthfulness of the historical content of Geoffrey's book in future lectures of this series. For now, we're going to look carefully at Geoffrey's motives for spending time on this work. So that's what I'm interested in doing in this episode. I want to look at what Geoffrey has to say, but I also want to look at his times, what was going on around him, because it, the context matters and it tells you a great deal about what he was trying to achieve with this book. So Geoffrey himself tells us that he was asked by a more senior churchman, Walter Archdeacon of Oxford, and I told you this, to translate a very ancient book that had come into his possession. He says it was written in the British tongue, which is to say Welsh. Apparently, Walter wanted a Latin translation. So Latin was the lingua franca of the day. Yes, we're talking about the Middle Ages, but still the educated classes talked in Latin. They, knew, they studied Latin, and that was very important. If you're, going, if you're English and you want to go and talk to the French or Germans or Italians, you don't know their languages, maybe. You might do, but maybe you don't. You could all talk in Latin. So Latin was still the lingua franca of the old Roman Empire, you could say, and actually beyond it into Germany and Scandinavia and places that, that uh, weren't in the empire. Geoffrey, who would at the end of his life be consecrated as a suffragan bishop of St. Asaph's, obliged. Yeah, uh, bear in mind, you know, people who, who knock Geoffrey and say, well, he's a charlatan, wasn't he? He's a cheat. He was just writing this nonsense just to gain attention. You know, he's, he's a, you know. Well, first of all, if he, he's attributing this to Walter giving him the book, uh, and if, if he was doing that, yeah, Walter always has something to say to him, you know. What do you think you're doing? And also, he, his, as you'll see, his principal dedicatee was a very, very powerful man. You know, he's someone you would not want to upset. And if he's written a load of nonsense and then said, I, you know, I'm dedicating this to the most powerful baron in Britain, um, that wouldn't go down well either, would it? So... I don't think we can fault him on that score. He wasn't out to trick or hoax or uh, cajole or fool around or anything like that. He was doing what he really believed was taking the Welsh history version of history and putting it into Latin so that the educated classes of his day could read it. That's what he says he was doing, and I, that is what he was doing. Um, but he admits to giving a loose translation. I'm going to give you the exact words that he uses this. As he puts it, being content with my own expressions and my own homely style, and I have gathered no gaudy flowers of speech in other men's gardens. And as I say, I, I think that was a dig at the Oxford um, dons and academia. Oxford as a university, even in those days, now, the chief dedicatee of Geoffrey's book was Robert the Consul. He's a very important man, and we're going to have a lot to say about him. He was the eldest but illegitimate son of King Henry I. Henry I was the, and let me get this right, the third son, or maybe it was the fourth, and the first one died. 
Anyway, he had two elder brothers um, who were known about. He had William Rufus, who became King of England, and Robert, who became Duke of Normandy. And Henry the Henry the First was the the younger son, but he became king after Rufus. So he was the eldest, but illegitimate son uh, of Henry the First. That's um, we're talking about Robert the Consul here. Robert the Consul was the eldest but illegitimate son of Henry the First. Among Robert's titles were Earl of Gloucester and Lord of Glamorgan. And Robert the Consul was Geoffrey's own liege lord. So get this right. Uh, Robert the Consul in Geoffrey's day, he was the, the Earl of Gloucester and the Lord of Glamorgan. And how that came about, we'll discuss shortly. So he was a big deal as far as Geoffrey is concerned. Geoffrey was born in Monmouth, which was um, under the territory um, ruled by uh, Robert, the, Robert of Gloucester, Robert the Consul. And at that time, I should also add, he was um, the Palatine Lord of Glamorgan. I mean, he hadn't got a... He hadn't received that as a gift from the king. That, you know, the whole way that feudalism worked is you had the king on top and his nobles would gather round, they would claim him and they would swear allegiance to him. And in return for their allegiance, he would allow them to be Earl of this or Duke of that or whatever. He had the overall say. So you had to be stay in step. If you were going to be a rebel and you know go against your king, you better make sure that you were going to win, that you were backing the right candidate who's going to be the next king, or perhaps yourself, if you were strong enough, could overthrow the previous king to take the, the crown. You better be sure, because if you failed, at the very least, you're going to lose everything. You're going to be banished, you sent abroad, and your land's taken from you, your title stripped from you. At the very least, and you may very well end up on the scaffold having your head chopped off or worse still being hanged, drawn and quartered. So it's a big deal swearing an oath to a king. But in Wales, as we will see, Robert uh, uh, had these lands um, as palatine as a result of certain things. We'll discuss that in a minute. That meant that he was the overall lord himself and he didn't owe it to the King of England. So that's important as well. And Robert the Consul was Earl of Gloucester and Lord of Glamorgan. He gained these titles by marriage, right. So he married someone important. And his wife was called Mabilla, or Mabel, we would call her today. <laughs> he married Mabel, um, and she was the daughter of Sir Robert Fitzhammond, whose father, Hammon, Hamo or Hammon, had been a cousin of William the Conqueror. So Hamo was a big deal back in Normandy. And his son was, uh, you know, related. We're not quite sure how closely related. Probably second or third cousin um, to, you know, his father was to William the Conqueror, something like that. But he was family anyway. He was, you know, related. So that gave him certain prestige as well. Now, Sir Robert Fitzhammond, as I say, was a cousin of King William II Rufus. So William, the, there was William I, who was William the Conqueror, and he had three sons, and the, 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 all that lived, um, William Rufus was actually the second son, but he was very quick off the mark and became the next king of England. He left his brother Robert <laughs> behind, who became um, uh, Duke of Normandy. Actually, that's what his father wanted. He wanted Rufus to, to inherit. So uh, Sir Robert Fitzhammond helped Ru William Rufus put down a rebellion of the nobles at one point. And as a reward, William had given him the earldom of Gloucester. So Fitzhammond was, uh, Robert Fitzhammond was given the earldom of Gloucester by William II, William Rufus, that is, as a reward for helping him in a dangerous time 
when there was a rebellion. And to strengthen his position further, he married Sibylla, Sibyl, uh, who was a daughter of Roger de Montgomery, who was the Earl of Shrewsbury. Now, these names probably don't mean very much to you, but Robert de Montgomery was a very powerful baron, an earl, probably the most powerful at that time, uh, who had um, been involved in this rebellion at first against William Rufus, but Rufus had persuaded him to change size. So he came over to him and that helped reduce the rebellion. And perhaps it was something to do with Hammond being um, married to uh, to uh, Sibylla that brought that about. I'm not sure. It might have been that that marriage happened afterwards. I'm not totally sure on that. But anyway, she was a daughter of Roger de Montgomery, who's the Earl of Shrewsbury. And that Roger would play an, ex an active part in the Norman invasion of David, which is the part of South West Wales we now call Pembrokeshire. So we're beginning to see the, the, uh, the dominoes come into line here of what's really going on. So Sir Robert Fitzhammond is buried at Tewkesbury Abbey, which he was a benefactor of. You can see his uh, window here, and you can see on his tabard, you've got the, the lion there, the, the golden lion on a blue background. That was his coat of arms. So he's wearing his coat of arms in the window, and you see this all over the place. In 1092, he intervened in a war between two Welsh princes. There was Resap Tudor of Diabath, which is southwest Wales. It's actually larger than Pembrokeshire. It includes Cardiganshire and a large part of Carmarthenshire, but would have been Diabath uh, at that time. It's, we would call it a principality, but they call them, uh, often call them kingdoms. Uh, and these warring little kings, they're, they're sort of reguli, small kings within Wales. There might be one who rose above the rest and he became king of kings, but they were always squabbling that's going to go on between these two rival kings. One rules in southwest Wales and the other rules in southeast Wales. So you had, um, you know, this Resap Tudor. Tudor... Uh, it's the same name as uh, Tudor in, in Elizabeth Tudor and Henry Tudor and so on, the Tudor dynasty of England. They, they were descended from the same lineage, ultimately, the Tudor lineage. Um, so Resap Tudor was the king of Diabath, and Yestin, who was actually a distant cousin of his, was ruler in Glamorgan, uh, the southeast part, and they were squabbling. And... They were squabbling over the territory in part of Carmarthen, the eastern part of Carmarthen, which would now be, I suppose, around Llanelli, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, Swansea area. <laughs> they were fighting over that. Um, and there were other causes. There was a lot of antagonism and enmity between them anyway. And by all accounts, Yestin Ap Gergen was not a nice man. He was over 100 when this was all going on, according to a certain Welsh text. I don't know if that's true, but that's what it says. Anyway, so um, what happened was Yestin turned to Sir Robert Fitzhammond for help. He, you know, the, the uh, Earl of Gloucester is a neighbour. And uh, he, he turned to him and said, oh, I've got this problem, you know. Uh, he, this nasty ant man, he reached up Tudor, he's trying to take my lands. Can you come and help me? <laughs> and you didn't want to do that with the Normans. You let the Normans get a foothold and you've lost everything. Ask the Irish. <laughs> so this is what happened. And and uh, 1092, and Fitzhamon said, well, yeah, of course, I can come and help. Um, so he turned up. He got an army of 3,000 men, as well as his 12 best knights. And um, Yeston had a few other allies who were rebelling against Rees. So they were also some, French, uh, some Welsh um, men fighting on his side from the other side. 
and Fitz Hammond made sure that they, they went to the front. So they were taking the casualties, these, these Welsh guys from the southeast, uh, southwest. And so when, when the battle is over, his army is nice and intact, and they are battered. So then Rhys was defeated and killed in battle. However, Fitz Hammond saw for himself how fertile the Vale of Glamorgan was. And the Vale of Glamorgan is the southern part of Glamorgan. Uh, parts of Glamorgan are very mountainous. You know, you've got these, these narrow valleys going up into the hills and mountains with rivers coming down. Um, and places like Merthyr Tidville, for example, um, were up the valleys. And that later on was where all the coal was. And so they became quite rich during the 19th century. Not aren't so much now, but at that time they became quite, quite rich, partly from coal and partly from making steel because they had iron ore as well. Um, but in these earlier times, the fertile plain of Glamorgan was where you wanted to be because it's very, very good soil, good farmland. And, and uh, Fitzhamon saw that. So um, he pretended to sail away, um, but then he came back. So it says that he and his knights deposed Yestin, making Fitzhamon the new Lord of Glamorgan. So he's become the Lord of Glamorgan. Uh, he shared out the castles and manors of the Vale of Glamorgan among his knights, and they're known in Wales as the Knights of Despoilation. So they took all the castles and manors from the local lords and uh, knights or whatever was owning them prior to that, the British nobility of that area. They took all that stuff and took over, took over themselves and installed their own families there, their own Norman uh, lineage, and they, everyone had to report to them. So that's why they are called the Knights of Despoilation. We'll have more to say about that in later episodes. As Wales was not, not at that time subject to the crown of England, this made Fitzhamon's rule palatine. I, I said that earlier. He was, in effect, the king of Glamorgan, owing no taxes or fealty for this land to William II, Rufus, who was then the king of England. So he owed taxes on his Gloucester estates, and he had other estates in other parts of England too. <laughs> These guys, had, they had bits and pieces all over the place. They were very rich. Um, but he owed all that to uh, you know, his fealty to the king, at that time William II. So, but as far as Wales was concerned, he had won that with his own arms. You know, his own fighting men paid for by him. That's his. <laughs> his, his booty. So he didn't have to pay any tax to the king for that. That's great. Already rich, his conquest of Glamorgan made him one of the richest men in the land. So he's quite something now. Now, the death of Rhysap Tudor of Diobath, that's southwest Wales, left his family in a precarious position. He's died on the battlefield, and his very beautiful daughter, Nest, she's said to have been the most beautiful woman in Wales perhaps in the whole of Britain, um, was taken as a hostage back to London. And there, she became for a time the mistress of Prince Henry, later to be King Henry, said that she caught his eye. According to Welsh sources, Robert the Consul, ah, the dedicatee of, um, you know, Geoffrey of Monmouth's book, the dedicatee, um, was their illegitimate son. There's a bit more to say on that. Um, some Welsh sources say that they were actually married. However, in English law, this was regarded as morganatic only. So what does morganatic mean? Um, it means kind of what we would today call um, a common law wife. So they're living together, but yeah, she's his wife. But it's not really the same thing as having signed documents and having been to church and had it consecrated in the eyes of God, you know, as a wife. 
Um, morganatic, they, I'm told, means that uh, you go to bed with a lady and you, in the morning you give her a nice present. <laughs> and so morgan meaning mor morning. So morning time, oh, here's a nice ring for you, my dear. Uh, <laughs> a bit like treating her as a, a prostitute, you might say. So that's not, you know, really... You know, what, what, it's perhaps better to say she was his mistress. I think that's, that's perhaps a more uh, meaningful term. <clears throat> and such marriages, if we can call them that, have no legal standing. And so the children of such a union have no right of inheritance of the wealthy partner's property. That, so that's, marriage is not just about saying, I love you, I want to marry you. Uh, will you be my wife? It's actually um, a legal process. You're actually signing, signing a, a pledge. You're taking an oath and signing a contract for, with that other person that you're going to um, love them and support them, look after them. In those days, the, the wife would have to say she's going to obey the, the husband. We don't do that now in, in, in uh, Britain. We wouldn't dare. Um, but um, the situation in those days was a, it was a legal thing. So if a husband then divorced his wife, she had rights. First of all, she's going to get her dowry back, and, and she may even have rights beyond that. Uh, if you just a morganatic marriage, you know, she's his mistress, well, whatever she's got, she's got, and that's it. Um, there's no repercussions going down the line. Nest had other relationships and children. Eventually she was married off to Gerald of Windsor and he was the castellan of Pembroke Castle. By him she had a number of children called, collectively known as the Fitzgeralds. Right? Fitz means the same as the French word fils. It means son. So the sons of Gerald um, among her grandchildren was the monk Gerald of Wales. Partly Welsh himself, he accompanied Baudouin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, in a peregrination through Wales. That means, you know, a, a pilgrimage through Wales. And this was to drum up recruits for the First Crusade. Yeah, I've actually got his book here, Gerald of Wales. Uh, it's an interesting book. It tells you a lot about Wales at that time, uh, if his peregrination, uh, which would have been roughly around the same time. Let's see, 1188 was the peregrination. So, um, Gerald of Wales. It made sense for Henry, that's Henry I, um, to arrange for his illegitimate son, Robert the Consul, to marry Mabilla, the wealthy heiress of the Fitzhamon fortune. So we have this illegitimate son, Robert, Robert the Consul, he's generally called. Um, he has this very fortunate marriage to Mabel, <laughs> Mabilla, and that's probably fixed up by his, his dad, Henry I, uh, with uh, Roger de Montgomery, um, have her dad. They... they they made a new alliance, and probably part of that alliance was his. He, you know, Henry I hadn't got a legitimate son to say, marry your daughter. Um, what he had got was his eldest son, who's Ill illegitimate but still very well thought of, to marry the daughter. So that brought great benefits to Robert the Consul. So she brought the fortune while Robert brought the Welsh blood of Nest along with the blood of the King of England himself. And I think this is important. In this way, royal blood, Welsh as well as Norman, was restored to the Lordship of Glamorgan. So I think that was important, a part of the whole process. Uh, he, he's now rich, he's got the, the position to be able to do all this, and he's, he's now um, taking over Glamorgan and probably doing that with certain fealty to the king at the same time. 
King Henry the First, that's um, his father, yeah, Robert the Consul's father, um, came onto the throne of England in 1100. So that's 36 years before the publication of Geoffrey of Monmouth. But under strange circumstances, his elder brother, William II, yeah, that's William Rufus, we talked about earlier, was not a nice man and generally hated. Very few lamented his death in a hunting accident. A hunting accident. Um, the arrow that killed him was shot by Sir Walter Tyrrell, the son-in-law of Richard Fitzgilbert de Clare, a half-brother of William I. Now, I'm sorry, I'm introducing a lot of names here, but you're going to find out about the Clares in later episodes. They're very, very important in medieval history too. And this um, uh, Richard, uh, I call him Richard of Tunbridge because I lived not that far from Tunbridge and Tunbridge Castle was where he lived a lot of the time. But he also had estates in Suffolk and Clare. So he's generally, he had the Clare title, Richard de Clare. Um, but he's also Richard of Tunbridge, and he also had titles in Normandy. Uh, I think um, Bienfe and Orbeck, I think, were his uh, titles there. So he, he was a, a cousin. Uh, no, actually, he was a half-brother of William the Conqueror um, through their shared mother. So... Um, that was a great, you know, that gave them great position in in England, and the Clares were well, you know, they were the family. You know, this is the whole thing's run a bit like mafia. You know, <laughs> the family comes first. So uh, the arrow that killed him, that killed um, William the Second, was shot by Sir Walter Tyrrell, the son-in-law of Richard Fitzgilbert de Clare, a half brother of William the First. And if William II's death was a conspiracy, and as a lot of people think that it wasn't just an accident, <laughs> they bumped him off in the, in the New Forest. You can go to the New Forest and you can go to a plain that, place there, it's, it's signpost is called Rufus Stone. And there you can go and there's a stone there, supposedly marks a spot where there used to be an oak tree, which the arrow had bounced off and uh, hit William Rufus in the chest. So that's, that's the story that was put out. But many people think that actually it was an assassination. Um, so Henry was, all, if, if it was a, an assassination, Henry would have probably known about it. And he was close friends with his first cousins, the sons of Richard de Clare. Yeah, they were, they were you know, a close family. And Tyrrell, who shot the fatal arrow, was the husband of their sister Adelise. So <laughs> it's all family, you know. Um, even if Henry knew nothing of any plot, he certainly saw an, his opportunity. He quickly gathered the support of enough of the nobility and clergy to secure the crown, whilst his eldest brother, Robert of Normandy, was one, on his way home from the Crusades. So there were three of these brothers. Rufus had uh, had England, although he was the second son. Robert was Duke of Normandy. And Henry now quickly stepped in to get himself crowned as King of England, while his eldest brother, Robert of Normandy, was still on his way home, coming back from the Crusades. You know, he's a hero. He's been on the Crusades. But that doesn't avail him if he's not around. Henry's relationship with his brother Robert was fraught, leading to several rebellions by the latter and his barons. Eventually, Henry defeated his rival, placing him under house arrest in Cardiff Castle for the remainder of his days. This meant he had Henry's son Robert the Consul as his jailer. So Robert the Consul is now jailer to this other Robert, Robert of Normandy, the eldest son of William the Conqueror, he's got him incarcerated in the castle. I don't know if he's put, I don't think he'd be put in a, a cell like a, 
a convicted prisoner, you know, sleeping on straw. He probably had a nice apartment and looked after decent food and the rest of it. But he was not allowed to get out and he was not allowed to go back to Normandy. Um, Robert II, Duke of Normandy, died in 1134. And he lies buried in Gloucester Cathedral in a magnificent tomb. And you can go there to Gloucester. Uh, I think it was St. Peter's Abbey at the time. It's now Gloucester Cathedral. It's a lovely building, actually, Gloucester Cathedral. And you'll see he's got a great big tomb with iron bars protecting it. And you, you'll see his, his coloured effigy there. Um, you know, they gave him a decent burial, <laughs> even if they uh, you know, didn't let him become King of England. Now then, King Henry I died the following year on December the 1st, 1135. So Robert's died in 1134. Henry's died now in at the very end of 1135. As he had no living legitimate son, <coughs> this brought about a further crisis. His immediate heir was his daughter, known as the Empress Matilda, from her first marriage to the Emperor Henry IV. Now the Emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, would be um, in Germany or Austria. <coughs> Maybe in Prague, I'm not sure at that time. But anyway, um, he's the po most powerful potentate in Europe, generally speaking. Uh, England was a bit of a sideshow at that time. So she's made a very good marriage. She's married the emperor. Um, but it didn't last. <laughs> um, they got divorced. And she subsequently married again. And by her second marriage to Geoffrey of Anjou, Anjou is a part of northern France. Um, I'm trying to think where the, the major cities. I think Rouen was the capital of Anjou. And it was a powerful um, duchy in its own right and growing. Um, and Geoffrey of Anjou was quite a figure in, in history. And she had a son also called Henry. So she's got a Henry as her son. Um, oaths had been sworn by the nobility, that's the nobility of England particularly, on the king's death, that on the king's death, Matilda would inherit the throne, and that way the crown would pass to Henry's heirs through his grandson, another Henry. So you can see the difficulty here. Henry I hasn't got a, a legitimate son, but he wants his line to continue. And he's got a daughter, Matilda, you know, she's the empress, still has the title, you know, a bit like Diana was still the princess of Wales right up to her death, although she was divorced. So he's got this daughter and she has, a, has got a son, a legitimate son, um, in Rouen, the, you know, um, ideal. So he wants the, uh, the nobility to have sworn an oath to him that she will become, uh, or perhaps they will skip a generation and go straight to, to her son Henry to become king. Um, but that's the way it's meant to go. However, almost immediately, Henry's favourite nephew, Stephen of Blach, claimed the throne of England for himself. Yeah, he was very, you know, the people in England knew him. Um, and he was uh, very popular, good knight, good manners, good way of talking. People liked him on, on the whole. He was eloquent and well-liked. With backing from the church and the people of London, he was crowned at Westminster just three weeks later, on the 22nd of December, 1135. So he's learnt the lesson <laughs> with Henry, with Robert. Henry nipped in there quickly, got himself crowned as King of England before Robert could get back from the, the Crusades. And once you're king, you're king. <laughs> You've been anointed, you're God's anointed, everything you're wearing the crown. It's a lot harder to take that crown off King's head than to nip in first and get it um, and get yourself crowned. And that's what Stephen did. Well... Matilda was a strong-headed woman. 
who was not about to give up her son's inheritance without a fight. Yeah, she wanted her son and her her progeny to uh, inherit the, the throne of England. Why wouldn't she? So this started a prolonged period of civil war in England and Wales, known as the Anarchy. And a major figure in this was going to be her half-brother, Robert the Consul. And that's, you know, we'll come to that in a second. Um, it began, the, the struggle began in 1139, uh, the anarchy, and would last until 1152, when a truce was made on the basis that whilst he lived, Stephen should continue to rule. After he died, the crown should pass to Matilda's son, Henry. So they'd had this period of civil war, it's anarchy, and a lot of people died in it. It was a very serious business. Um, eventually, they realised that this is stupid. Uh, at that time, Stephen had, hadn't got a son anyway. So they made an agreement that when he died, um, her son Henry would inherit um, the, the throne of England. And Stephen died in 1154, to be followed by Matilda's son, Henry II. And he was the first of the Plantagenets and was to become one of England's greatest and most famous kings of all time. Yeah, well, another movie for you to watch, if you ever get the chance, is A Lion in Winter. Uh, it's, it's in the later period of his, his life when he's got these three sons and they're trying to take his crown um, including Richard II, who was uh, Richard the Lionheart, and John, uh, and a, a third one. So, this was the situation in 1135, when Walter the Archdeacon of Oxford asked, or maybe even ordered, Geoffrey of Monmouth to translate into Latin the very ancient book in the British language. In other words, um, Henry I had died, um, Robert of Normandy had died the year before him. Stephen had seized the crown very quickly in 1135, in the end of December. The Empress Matilda was furious, and Robert the Consul was her half-brother. So you had the situation where Henry's eldest son was Robert the Consul, and Robert the Consul was the guy to whom this book was dedicated. So what do you think Geoffrey's purpose was in translating the book, or Walter's purpose in getting him to translate the book? Well, given the timing, there was clearly a political motive for Geoffrey's having been asked to translate this book at this time. The chief dedicatee was none other than Robert the Consul, who as Earl of Gloucester and Lord of Glamorgan was the most powerful baron in Britain. Now, get that? He was the man. There you see, he, see him in this picture. You've got his shield with his arms. This is actually in Cardiff Castle. This, there's a great, great big fireplace, and this is part of it. And, and that's over the top of the fireplace. And you, On the side, you see a grill and there's a man peeping out of it. Uh, uh, he's Robert, Duke of Normandy, who's been imprisoned in Cardiff Castle. As we will discover as we progress in this series, both Yestin ap Gergen, uh, I sh should tell you that Yestin means Justin, ap means son of, Gergen means George. So we've got Justin, son of George, of Morganu. Morganu basically means Glamorgan, but it was a bit bigger than Glamorgan is today. And Rhys ap Tudor, that's Rice, the son of Tudor, of Derbath, um, claimed descent from the, the same, uh, both of them claimed descent from the ancient kings of Britain discussed in Walter's book. So, this book here, the ancient kings of Britain, it goes down to Cadwallader, but the, the lineages didn't stop at Cadwallader. They carry on, and they carry on in all sorts of principalities and little kingdoms and so on, including Deobarth and, and um, Glamorgan, Morganug. So 
Basically, I think in publishing this book, Walter and Jeffrey were saying and dedicating it to Robert. They're saying, "Look here, uh, look you, <laughs> look you, you, you're Welsh, you know, <laughs> or part Welsh," and uh, they were saying to him, "Look, you got the rights of." of uh, the Welsh lineage and uh, the, the lineage of the ancient kings of Britain. Now's your chance. Yeah, you're the most powerful man in Britain. Yeah, kick Stephen off the throne. Yeah, he's a usurper. Don't let him get away with it. You're the man. You're Henry the first son. Yeah, you're Welsh. <laughs> they want him to, to stand up for himself. That's what I think was going on there. And that is the political thing. So, to put in a nutshell, through his mother Nest, Robert the Consul was a grandson of Rhys. Furthermore, as Lord of Glamorgan, he ruled over the richest part of Yestin's former kingdom. Thus he was heir to both, the Welsh house, to both Welsh houses and could be said to be descended from the original and most ancient kings of Britain. And we can therefore suspect that Geoffrey of Monmouth's and Walter Mapp's real purpose was to remind Robert of his own rightful claim to the throne of all Britain. You know, the fact that he was only an illegitimate son of Henry I by a Morganatic marriage, whatever that might mean, didn't matter. I mean, think about it. Only two generations earlier, William the Conqueror, he was also illegitimate. He was the illegitimate um, uh, Duke of uh, Normandy, um, but he he become Duke of Normandy, and then he's seized his chance, grabbed England, uh, deposed Harold, arrow through his eye, and taken over the throne. I think these guys were saying, "Look, forget the fact that you are illegitimate. You're Morganatic son of uh, Princess Nest. You have the lineage of the Welsh. You should be King of Wales, and and you're the son of Henry the First. Yeah, okay, you, the, he hadn't married Nest, but you're still his firstborn. Get for, go for it, man, go for it. I think that's what they were doing. There were also parallels with the life and times of King Arthur to consider. Yeah, well, if he reads the book, and he's going to read it, you can be sure of that. Uh, Henry had not exactly been a paragon of virtue. No, he hadn't, Henry I. He had had many mistresses besides Nest and many illegitimate children. However, after the turbulent times of the two Williams, that's William I, the Conqueror, and William II, Rufus, he had brought peace to the land. This, in turn, had fostered a period of relative prosperity. So now with uh, this impasse with Stephen having grabbed the throne, it was, it was upset. And that's going to affect everyone's income, prosperity. The hasty coronation of Henry's nephew Stephen within three weeks of the former's death in December 1135 had uncomfortable echoes of the usurpation of Arthur's throne by his nephew Mordred. Yeah, and Mordred was the nephew of King Arthur, so it says in, in this book. Um, you know, Stephen comes over as being a Mordred figure. And Morgan, Morganatic on otherwise, Robert the Consul was King Henry's eldest son. Should he not now use, unseat the usurper and take the crown himself? That's in 1136. So remember, this book's published in 1136. Stephen has got the crown for himself in December 1135. So he's only just been crowned. Was this not what Welshmen such as Geoffrey longed for the restoration of the true line of British kings. Robert needed to be told, but in an oblique way that would not rebound against the teller. So Geoffrey and, and Walter, they couldn't say this openly. They couldn't go up and say, look, get out there, you know, this could be yours. They did it obliquely. They put the, the Welsh text, the Welsh documents the, uh, the story um, from, translated from the old Welsh book, and we'll be talking about what that old Welsh book is in the next episode. But they put all that into here, into a form which is easy to read. It's a homely style. And 
the, the message is clear. You know, you, if you want something, go for it. You have the right and we'll be behind you. The, the, the Welsh will be with you all the way. In the event, Robert did act, but not perhaps as Geoffrey and Walter might have hoped. He threw his lot in with his half-sister Matilda and her son Henry, Count of Anjou. This had other surprising ramifications, not least because Henry II was married to an extraordinary woman himself, Eleanor of Aquitaine. <laughs> I, I tell you, this is, this is the drama of all dramas, this period of history. It's very, very exciting what was going on, um, not just in England, but all over Europe and, and especially in France. Eleanor of Aquitaine was perhaps the richest as well as the most extraordinary and colourful woman in medieval history. I, don't, I think few people would disagree with that. In her own right, she was Duchess of Aquitaine, which was a large province of southwest France that included the wealthy wine uh, making area of Bordeaux and much else besides. She was also a very cultured person who was patroness to a number of poets including Wace. Yeah, she was quite a lady. In 1137, no, this is, you can't make this up, you know, this book had been published in 1136, the very next year. In 1137, her father died suddenly while on pilgrimage. Yeah, he was going to Compostela in northern Spain, you know, to pray at the, t the tomb of St. James. And she was still only 13 at the time. You know, it's a little girl of 13. And suddenly she came into her birthright as Duchess of nearly half of France. Actually, it's not nearly half. I'm exaggerating there. But it was a big slice. And she was notionally under the guardianship of King Louis VI, King of France, known as Louis the Fat. <laughs> Make of that what you will. And he decided that a much better solution was for her to marry his 17-year-old son, also called Louis. You know, you can imagine the King of France, he's seen the chance again. Aquitaine is rich province. That could be a family thing, you know. Get out there, son, you know. Marry this girl. She's 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 got Aquitaine, for God's sake. Bring it all into the family. So they were married on the twenty fifth of July, eleven thirty seven. Yeah. And um, however, fate had more in store that year. Louis the sixth died on August the first. So <laughs> she's just got married. You know, within a week, the dad has died. And her husband is, <laughs> is suddenly king. Thus, the, this newlywed girl and her, and her teenage husband, he's only 17 himself, suddenly find themselves king and queen of France. <laughs> I tell you, they, they should make a, a, a Netflix documentary or drama, drama, whatever they call it, on uh, this period of history. That, you know, forget about our royals. Nothing really has happened since the war, has it? Um, but this is the real stuff, I tell you. In 1152, Eleanor and Louis VII got divorced, you know, mutually. They, they were always fighting. Um, they'd been on incredible adventure. They'd been on a crusade to... Um, you know, the Second Crusade to go and rescue Jerusalem or support it. And they'd been attacked by the Turks in Turkey and she was nearly captured and they'd been shipwrecked and, and somehow everyone thought they were dead. They were on separate ships because they were arguing so much. Both ships shipwrecked, both believed to be dead. Then they found their way back to Italy and um, somehow they got back to France and then... In 1152, um, they decided they had enough, you know, they got you know, an annulment from the Pope and they got divorced. And the same year, she, she knew she was, she was now this right plum. Everybody's after her, you know. People even tried to you know, kidnap her to make, them, make her marry them. So she asked uh, Henry of Anjou, come and marry me quickly. <laughs> so within weeks, she married uh, Henry of Anjou. Um, who's going to be Henry II. 
And two years later, in 1154, Stephen died. So she's been married to Henry for two years now. Um, he died and Henry was crowned as King Henry II of England with Eleanor as queen. Thus, this remarkable woman was wife to her second king, this time of England as opposed to France. With her huge dowry in Aquitaine, along with Henry's lands in Anjou and Normandy, yeah, he was also Duke of Normandy, they now effectively ruled over one third of France as well as England. So this is what's sometimes called the Angevin Empire, um, or the Plantagenet Empire, perhaps we should call it. And uh, it was an extraordinary event. And actually, it was, it was going to prove a lot of trouble for England in the future. Uh, it was the, going to be the cause of all these territories in France, and uh, uh, getting them back was the cause of the Hundred Years' War. Uh, but that was in the future. For now, everything was hunky-dory, and they were very, you know... Well, happy, is that right term? Um, they fought a lot as well. She was a very feisty woman. Um, but she does seem to have loved Henry. Um, Eleanor was fessoned as well as beautiful. She bore Henry eight children, including the boys who would become King of England. So this Richard and John's mum. Her daughter, daughter, she had two daughters by Louis, remained close to their mother and her second family from Henry. So... Her daughters, by her first marriage, um, they're not necessarily living with her, but they were very close, um, and um, particularly her, her eldest daughter. So, from Henry, he, of course, was the nephew of Robert the Consul. So Henry II is the nephew of Robert the Consul. He had, this is Henry, Henry had fond memories of his uncle, as his mother's champion through the hardest times of the anarchy. So Robert was dead by this time, but, um, you know, Henry still revered his uncle, who he, he knew, he's, he'd been over to stay with him, he knew him, and he revered him greatly as this great uncle, you know, my, my uncle looked after my mum, you know, held up the line when, you know, she was being captured and uh, and all of that. So... He had a lot to thank his uncle for, and was very fond of him. Chrétien de Troyes, that's the, uh, the guy who writes all the Arthurian songs and uh, the first uh, really popular French stories about King Arthur, is said to have flourished between 1165 and 80, with Eleanor's daughter Marie, Countess of Champagne, which includes the city of Troyes, I think Troyes, is the capital of Champagne, what it was then, as his patron. Thus there is every reason to suppose that Chrétien came by the story of King Arthur from Geoffrey of Monmouth's translation of the old book. Yeah? The, Geoffrey of Monmouth's book is where that tra the, the story of Arthur first comes to light. But it's only handwritten, you know, there's not many, it's not like this, in the Penguin edition, you can go and buy your in, you know, favourite bookshop or off Amazon. It wasn't like that in those days. It was a situation where every book had to be handwritten. So they're still relatively rare. It could even be that Geoffrey gave a copy of his book to Robert. He probably signed it for him. <laughs> to, to my lord, Robert. Uh, from his his obedient servant Geoffrey or something of this sort <laughs> may have had that but it's, he's his dedicatee he's got to have given him a copy um, uh, and then passed on to his nephew Henry yeah he could easily have passed it on to his nephew Henry yeah have, have a good read of this Henry you'll enjoy it great great yarn read by Eleanor yeah she's a great la lady of letters herself and loved this kind of thing, and passed on by her to Marie. Yeah, Marie is also a very cultured lady, who had her own, her own court in Troyes, in Champagne. And Chrétien de Troyes is, um, you know, he's her chanson, he sings things, and play, probably plays a lute, and writes things. And she probably said, yeah, you read this about Arthur, he's a great, great knight, a great king, 
uh, you, you'll enjoy it. And Crazy Ann probably may, may even have been reading Robert's own book. Um, they thought, oh, this, is a good, this could be a real, real hit. I'll write songs about this. I'll write poems. I'll write, you know, stories. I can, you know, these different nights at the round table, we can, we can extend this story into all sorts of directions, you know. So we got the franchise and let's, let's use the franchise to make other stories. We'll have someone called Lancelot. We'll take away and we'll make him a big deal. Yeah, we'll have Sir Balls and we'll have all these other nights and we'll have them doing adventures. Oh, it's going to be great. And that's how we get the whole um, explosion of Arthurian literature in the Middle Ages. And that is wonderful, but it has rather overshadowed the original book. People don't remember that the story of Arthur was only one small section in a much larger work. And that's, I think, partly is what's brought derision upon Geoffrey of Monmouth's own work, is the fact that there have been all these other Arthurian things, and people say, well, people are writing all sorts of stuff about Arthur. Geoffrey is just one of them, isn't he? Maybe he's the first, but... You know. They don't realise that we're dealing with something of a quite different nature. We're dealing with, yes, the ancient histories are not quite like the histories we would write today, but it was based on something very, very real. And we'll go into that in the next lecture. So Je Geoffrey of Monmouth died in 1154, the same year that Henry II became King of England. Now, that, isn't that another extraordinary coincidence? And at that time he was a bishop, remember? He's a, a suffragan bishop of St. Asaph's in North Wales. He knew nothing about French troubadours, such as Chrétien, or the way the story of Arthur would come to epitomise the chivalric ideals of Europe. As far as he was concerned, he was translating in his own homely way the history of his nation, the Welsh. In the next episode, we're going to examine Geoffrey's translation and compare it with what must have been the original text he translated, which is a book known as the Brut de Cilio. Though it is not mentioned in polite academic circles, this still exists. <laughs> I tell you, you, you read most commentaries on Geoffrey of Monmouth and they start off by saying, well, it's a hoax, he wrote all this stuff, it's nonsense, we've got no evidence for it. There is a book written in Welsh <laughs> called the Brute Cecilio, which is quite clearly, when you study it and you compare it with Geoffrey, is the original, but not written in a homely style. <laughs> Simple as that. We'll go into that in the next lecture. Um, uh, though it's not mentioned in polite academic circles, this still exists. I, for one, am thankful that my late friend Alan Wilson drew my attention to what is the, the key to the entire lost history of Britain. So I owe it to Alan, A, for reigniting my interest in Geoffrey of Monmouth, and B, indicating to me this other book, which is the real thing. And it has been translated into English, and we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. So if you're still with me, thank you very much for your time and your patience. Uh, if you're not subscribed, please do. But even more, if you want to help my work and support it, please consider becoming a patron, which you can do through patreon.com. Um, my page on patreon.com is patreon.com forward slash Adrian Gilbert. Yeah, Patreon. I'll, I'll put it in the, the box down below. You can have a look there. But please consider it. It only costs you five pounds a month and you'll be helping me make more of these programs and to develop what I call the Invisible College. So thank you very much for your time, and we'll speak again. Right.